So joining us now, we've got the founder of The Daily Poster, um, great friend of the show, David Sirota. Great to see you, David. Great to see you. Thanks for having me. Of course. So we were just chatting about um, Governor Cuomo. I know one of your personal favorites. You've been a longtime uh, admirer of his leadership in New York. No, I mean, seriously, David, you get a lot of credit because before anyone was covering this guy's actual record during COVID, you were highlighting in particular the corruption with the liability shield that he lifted directly from industry language in order to protect nursing home executives. Why do you think it is that this time he he actually got taken out and ends up resigning? And also, why do you think it is that those scandals with regards to the nursing home and hiding the deaths and corruption and all of that, why that wasn't sufficient (laughs) to take him out to start with? Well, that's the disturbing thing, is that there was a lot that came out uh, about his actual record on economic policy, on health care policy and the like, uh, corruption. A lot came out before the uh, details of him being a sexual predator came out. And the law enforcement apparatus really did not move against him, and the political apparatus really did not move against him until the uh, sexual harassment uh, stuff all came out after uh, the other stuff. So the question is, have we actually normalized all of the other stuff? I mean, have Mm -hmm. we actually sent a message as the political system and the governmental law enforcement system sent a message that, hey, you know, if you bury the data on nursing home deaths, uh, if you give uh, corporate liability shields to your nursing home industry donors, all to get a $5 million book deal for yourself, Is that all okay, right? I mean, and I think when we walk away from this and we look at this, I think the answer is that the political and government and law enforcement system basically said, yeah, that stuff is fine. Uh, Being a sexual predator uh, is not fine. Now, look, it's good news that Andrew Cuomo uh, is being forced from office uh, because of those, uh, uh, the the details of him being a sexual predator. Like that stuff is what he did was really, really bad. But I think the question is why was the other stuff okay? And, And I would suggest the part of it has to do with the fact that if you go after Andrew Cuomo for what he did on nursing home issues and corruption and doing doing favors for his donors, then the political system itself is essentially a scandalizing and criminalizing a lot of stuff that it, it that the system itself has been involved in. In other words, a lot of those members of the legislature, for instance, uh, who might uh, want to impeach him or, or would consider impeaching him over the nursing home issue, in, in some ways, they were complicit too, right? I mean, they, the, the, the Democrats in the New York Assembly, uh, they got a lot of money from the same health care interests uh, that were given a legal liability shield uh, for what they did in the COVID disaster. So to go after that would be to potentially open up uh, other scrutiny of other people in New York politics. And so it was kind of swept under the rug. So, David, um This is a pretty simple question, but do you think he would have gotten away with everything else in the long run if there wasn't the sexual harassment stuff? Because I was reading last night, and you actually wrote a lot of the stuff that I was reading, but, you know, there was an investigation into, or is an investigation ongoing into what used to be called the Tappan Zee Bridge, and now it's called the Cuomo Bridge because they they use the incorrect bolts and the bolts were breaking for the bridge and they tried to bury that. So could he potentially have gone down for something like that? Could he have gone down for the fact that his right-hand man and former campaign manager went down for over $300,000 in bribes? Could he have gone down for the nursing home thing? What's your take on that? Well, look, there's a lot of scandals in in Andrew Cuomo's past, uh, and he's managed to basically uh, just muscle through them. Uh, And I think we live in an era where politicians have realized that that, that, that if they just don't say anything and they just stay put, they can essentially uh, power through uh, things, uh, scandals that used to take down other politicians. Now, I don't know what would have come out. Uh, in a, a federal prosecution uh, investigation with subpoena power. It, it's not clear what would have come out in a full impeachment uh, inquiry uh, and an impeachment process. So it's hard to say uh, whether he would have survived. But but my point is, is that we saw during the COVID, uh, the, the, the last surge of the pandemic of last year, that he was considered a rising star and portrayed mm. as a great hero in the media as that nursing home situation was unfolding and as whistleblowers 
uh, in the New York legislature. People like Assemblyman Ron Kim uh, were blowing the whistle. And essentially, the political system, the media system, uh, didn't really care about those alarms. It just continued forward portraying him, uh, Cuomo, as a great hero. So I, I kind of think that what we've done is we've normalized a level of corruption uh, that 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 really uh, defines uh, politics in America today. I mean, and, and to be to be clear, look, Chris Christie proved this before, right, right across That's the bridge right. in New Jersey, right? Chris Christie had that huge scandal. Now, granted, it hurt his uh, favorability ratings, but Chris Christie remained in office through that entire scandal uh, and just kind of muscled through it. And and so it leaves us with the with the idea that if you're a politician who does really really awful scandalous things, in a lot of ways, you can just sit there and 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 essentially muscle through it. Yeah, and still to this day, to the point that, you know, when President Biden is asked, well, putting aside the sexual harassment stuff, did he do a good job? Oh, hell of a job as a government. <laughs> That's what hell Biden of a said. Job. That's right. Um, I wanted to ask you, David, uh, to lay out a little bit more of this latest piece you wrote about Obama and climate. Uh, we've been covering here a lot this week the UN climate report that came out that really laid out just how dire the situation truly is. Um, how far we've already gone down a very ugly path. Some of the damage irreversible, the the floods and the droughts and the wildfires we're experiencing now going to continue no matter what we do for the next 30 years. The the ice that's melting, all of those things going to continue for even longer. That's not to say we can't act and forestall the worst possible outcomes, however. And you're talking about how, look, we had another era of democratic control and we had a chance at that point to act earlier and get a handle on th these things. And not only did we not act, but we did the opposite of that under the Obama administration. Just make the case for us. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think this is something we really have to remember right now because there aren't going to be that many moments. Uh, it may, may, this may be the last moment where you have democratic control of Washington, so actually a chance to pass real things on climate uh, because when the Republicans are in control, I mean, that, that is a party of climate, a uh, full explicit climate denialism. But I, we have to remember that during the Obama era, uh, there was one way you could look at the policy of the Obama era was another form of climate denial. I mean, you have, there is a, a clip of Barack Obama only three years ago uh, demanding uh, an audience thank him. Uh, he said, that was me, people. That's the quote. When talking about record oil production, uh, record fossil fuel production during the Obama era, uh, he gave a speech in 2012 uh, in Oklahoma touting all sorts of drilling records that were being uh, broken, uh, all sorts of uh, pipeline infrastructure construction uh, uh, levels uh, that were unprecedented that he was presiding over uh, and that he was supporting during his presidency. And there wasn't uh, much a democratic pushback, at least not pushback to change that policy. So the point is, is that if you actually look at the Obama administration record on fossil fuels flooding into the world market, uh, you know, lifting the crude oil uh, export ban and the like, uh, it was a record that if we repeat at this point of democratic control of Washington, uh, we're essentially doomed. And the scary thing is, the really scary thing is, is that even in the last 24 hours, you've seen a kind of echoes of what's gone on, what went on in the Obama era. And, you know, Obama, great rhetoric on climate, uh, acknowledged it explicitly. And look, he wasn't all bad. I mean, he he did uh, solidify uh, or part, or add America as a participant in the, in the Paris Accords. So it wasn't all bad, certainly better than Donald Trump. But the point is, is that if you look at even what happened uh, the last 24 hours, same thing, right? Joe Biden is, has tweeted out, you know, climate is an emergency. We can't wait. And then within the same 24 hour window, he goes out and he calls for OPEC uh, to increase uh, the production of oil. Now, look, we have a serious problem with the world market and oil production. And, and if it's not produced in the United States, it'll be produced elsewhere. And how do we actually deal with that? Those are all legitimate questions. But there's obviously a fundamental uh, a contradiction when a president is saying, take climate change seriously and then pushing uh, for more oil production. That's what happened in the Obama era, and it was a disaster. If that happens again in this era, uh, it will be an even worse disaster. Now, all of that is, is a bummer, but here's the, the silver lining, is that I think that politics has changed a bit since the Obama era. And you do have a handful of legislators who are now saying they are not going to pass the infrastructure bill 
uh, unless an, a, a serious climate bill uh, passes along with it. That kind of dynamic in democratic politics really did not exist before. And so uh, those legislators who are saying they need, they're going to hold out, whether or not they actually follow through, and that's a big if, uh, if they follow through or not, uh, that is a huge thing. It could be a game changer. Yeah, so David, how do we overcome, this is a point that Crystal's made over and over, I think Manchin is the head of one of the committees that's going to be in charge of stripping out a lot of these provisions on climate, and so I guess my question is, how do we overcome that? Is it like a bottom-up thing? Do we need bodies in the streets immediately to have any chance at all, or is it if these lawmakers that you just described, the left flank, if they hold the line... Is that going to be enough to get something done? How do we get from point A to point B? Well, I think it's all of the above. Uh, mm -hmm. I think legislatively, I think that that the and you know there's a lot of process being thrown here: the reconciliation bill and the infrastructure bill. But it, it's it's the the basics are this: Joe Manchin and and Kristen Cinema and conservative Democrats really want that infrastructure bill, that smaller bipartisan infrastructure bill, which doesn't have much climate stuff in it at all. They really, really want that. So the strategy here is that, uh, and, and this is the, the so-called no climate, no deal strategy. The strategy is basically, we will not pass that bill until the bill with the climate stuff, the reconciliation bill, also passes. And it's kind of a game of chicken. And the idea is that the best leverage that you have on Joe Manchin is if he wants that infrastructure bill, then he will have to accept the reconciliation bill. Uh, and that, to me, uh, that seems like just it, within this legislative battle here, this specific battle, that's what the no climate, no deal uh, crew has to hold out for and is saying they will hold out for. Now, look, we've been down this road before. I mean, the same crew uh, of progressive legislators did not hold out for a $15 minimum wage mm. uh, back in, in, the, in the first big uh, Biden spending bill. So again, whether or not they hold out is actually the big question. Uh, and whether or not they're really, really willing to play a game of chicken with Manchin is the question. And here's the thing, is that if they are willing to hold out, the best they can hope for, I think, is that it would mobilize the full force of the White House to put the screws on Manchin. In other words, mm. the White House wants all these bills as well. So the way to actually mobilize the White House's uh, apparatus is to say to the White House, if you don't fulfill our demands for that reconciliation bill, you're not getting any of this. And that mobilizes the White House uh, to actually put the pressure on the moderate part, uh, the conservative wing of the Democratic Party. Last question I wanted to ask you, David, I saw this conversation popping up on Twitter after Nina Turner lost in the Democratic primaries, basically like, you silly lefties, like, of course you're not gonna win when y'all are running around criticizing Barack Obama who's wildly popular in the Democratic base. Don't you know this isn't the way to get ahead in terms of politics? So I wonder if you could explain why, what you make of that criticism to start with and why you think it's important to set the record straight about the reality, nuance, good, bad, and ugly, all of that of the former president's actual legacy. Well, look, I, I certainly think we live in the era of identity politics, and the biggest and most powerful political identity has become uh, party affiliation and party loyalty. That is the world we live in. It is lamentable. Uh, it is a, uh, a product of decades of propaganda, uh, uh, corporate media propaganda, saying that the main thing people should focus on is uh, red versus blue. Uh, and that that race, the Ohio 11th District race, I mean, really did revolve around who is the most loyal person to the Democratic Party brand. Not who is better on the issues, not who is going to fight for a $15 minimum wage or a Green New Deal, but literally who is more loyal, uh, rhetorically speaking, to the Democratic Party establishment. Uh, and it's a kind of a tragedy that that's the way races are run. They're not really, they're not really about issues anymore, uh, and that that's trickled down uh, to the voters. Uh, and again, that's a product of, of that propaganda. And, and as, it, as it relates to former presidents, I mean, th that's the ultimate loyalty test. Have you ever criticized 
uh, a Democratic president, uh, a former Democratic president. And, and, and my take is, is that there's a lot of education that needs to be done uh, uh, through uh, media, uh, through uh, public information uh, about uh, the records of, we just talked about Barack Obama's record on climate. I mean, that is not really in the public consciousness, uh, what actually happened. It's not really in even the consciousness, the mass consciousness of the Democratic uh, primary electorate. Uh, and, and I don't think it's necessarily a good political strategy for a candidate uh, running for office uh, to necessarily, that's not really the candidate's job to criticize uh, former presidents, but it is the job of uh, uh, outside groups, uh, of uh, m honest media critics, uh, to do that public education. Uh, so that when a candidate says, listen, I think we need to have a better climate policy than we have under Barack Obama, uh, that that makes a whole lot of sense. I mean, that empirically makes a whole lot of sense, but politically it should make a, a whole lot of sense to be able to say that. But right now we're living in an environment where even if you say something like that, or as Nina Turner said, vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis Joe Biden, uh, I, I will be a, a congressperson who will push him to deliver more. Uh, that was portrayed as apostasy, as blasphemy. Mm -hmm as unacceptable. But we need to get to a politics where that's the kind of thing that we need from members of Congress. Yeah, I think that's really well said. Um, again, I just want to tell everybody, David was out front, um, and Daily Poster was out front, breaking news on Cuomo, always following the money in terms of corruption, breaking stories at the Daily Poster all the time. So if you guys are able, go over and subscribe to uh, dailyposter.com, doing great work there. If you believe in independent media, David is one of the people you should definitely be supporting. Always grateful for your time and your insights, David. Thank you so much. Thank you both. Thank you for having me. Always. And thank you guys for watching this week. Um, as always, if you also want to support us, $10 a month, become a premium subscriber. You get the videos an hour early. You get to help us say screw you, screw you to mainstream media. And actually this week, you get a premium member-only interview with Kyle Kalinske, ask you some questions about how the week went and your process and all that good stuff, all the things that you guys want to need to know. Normally, we do an Ask Me Anything with myself and Sagar that premium subscribers get, but since Sagar's not here, we're doing that instead. Thank you for doing this this uh, week. It's been fun. So it's my pleasure. Uh, again, I want to thank everybody out there for putting up with me. I know that people are fiercely loyal to the content creators that they support. So when somebody sits in the chair, it's always controversial. So again, <laughs> thanks to everybody for putting up with me. I apologize if I cursed way too much. I tried so hard to reel it in. Maybe I was a little bit successful. You guys will be the ultimate judge of that. But uh, if you don't mind, just real quick, a shameless plug for myself while I'm here. Uh, if you like me cursing like a sailor, please check out Secular <laughs> Talk on YouTube. That's my channel, where we also, by the way, um, we post clips from Crystal Kyle and Friends as well, which is my podcast with the brilliant and lovely Crystal Ball. And yeah. so, you know, you'll see me cursing in every video, and you'll see me and Crystal Ball talking to, you know, amazing people like Noam Chomsky and Cornell West and Bernie Sanders, who yeah. you just had an awesome interview with, and many others. So, again, thanks, everybody. I really appreciate it, and it's my pleasure to fill in for Sagar whenever uh, he wants to go and have a little getaway. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, go subscribe at Secular Talk. Um, we've got Stephen Donziger on Crystal Kyle and Friends for a long interview to talk about the way he's being, like, smeared and attempted to be destroyed by uh, Chevron, so you don't want to miss that. Um, appreciate you guys. Love you guys. Enjoy the weekend. We'll have some great content posting over the weekend as well, and we will see you next week. And assuming all goes well, Sagar will be ne back next week as well. Enjoy, guys.
Hey guys, thanks so much for watching. That's right. Just as a reminder, you can become a premium subscriber today. Watch the full show completely uncut. Our reactions to each other's monologues. You get to listen to it. You get to ask us questions. All that good stuff. Link is right there in the description or at breakingpoints.com. Best of all, great way to say screw you to the mainstream media.